Hi, welcome back to the Nav Station. I'm Andy Howe. Here at the Nav Station, our goal is to get you confident enough to head out on the ocean, turn off your GPS, and get to where you're going using celestial navigation. In the previous episode, we got in the Nautical Almanac and saw how to pull out GHA and declination figures for the sun and other bodies. Now we're going to go into the Nautical Almanac and learn how to correct a site. But first, let's take a look at a sextant, the various parts, some of the errors, a quick review of how to take a site before we start doing some more number crunching. This is my sextant. It's a Tamaya Spica model. It's a little over 40 years old. Still pretty much as good as new. I've replaced the mirrors a couple of times, uh, but no more than that. If you keep them, keep them well clean, rinse off the salt water, put a little light oil on the moving parts once in a while, keep them in the box, they'll be fine for, for generations. So the parts of a sextant that we're going to be concerned with. We have the arc of the sextant here, which is where the degree readings are going to come from. We have the telescope, most obvious feature. This is a standard telescope. I also have a higher power telescope, which gathers a lot more light and is useful for shooting stars. The index arm here, which is what moves around, contains at the top the index mirror, and at the bottom, what's called the micrometer drum and the vernier scale, which is where you measure your tenths and your minutes. The trigger here allows us to move this in a, in a gross manner, and the micrometer drum, each rotation is one degree, so that's the fine tuning. The index mirror is what captures the image of the body from the sky and projects it down to what's called the horizon mirror or horizon glass, and then back into your eye. For each mirror, there is a set of shades of different gradations. And as you get familiar with your sextant, you'll learn which shade combination works best for each mirror. The shades for the horizon mirror take care of glare on the horizon. The shades on the index mirror take care of the brightness of the body. Usually the only time you use, need to use these is for the sun, occasionally for the moon if, if it's an especially bright moon during twilight. So this particular sextant has what's called a split view horizon glass. That means that this side, the left side or the right side facing you, is clear and that is where you look through the telescope right at the line of the horizon. The other side in a split view mirror is a full mirror. It's blacked out on this side, as you can see. On another type of horizon mirror, you have something called a full view mirror, which is not blacked out on this side, but merely has a light coating of silvering which is sufficient to reflect the body's image back into your eye as you're looking through the telescope. So when we take a sight, we're finding the, the object up in the sky and detecting its altitude above the horizon by moving this index arm back and forth until such time as we bring that image down to the horizon. And we'll look at that in a second. There are a few errors that are inherent in each sextant and a few things you need to check before you head out on your voyage. The first is something called instrument error and that comes from the factory. A good quality sextant will have an, an instrument error card in the box. Usually the instrument error is a, a, a tenth or two or less and only applies at a particular range of altitude measurements. It's something that can't be corrected. It's part of the instrument. So just like a compass that has a deviation card, it's something you have to take care of in your calculations. 
The second uh, error that we'll talk about is what's called the perpendicularity of the index mirror. And that is something that you can check by turning the sextant around and looking through the mirror, you can't really see this, and getting a reflection of the arc in the mirror and then also looking across it and seeing the arc uh, through your naked eye. And if they line up, you're all set. If they don't, and when you get a section, you can see how easy this is to figure out. If they don't, there's a screw adjustment back here. In my sextant's case, I've got a little Allen wrench and that just moves the mirror back and forth from perp to perpendicular. So you adjust out that error if there is any. The other mirror, the horizon mirror, similarly has a perpendicular error measurement and that's called side error. And there's a e couple of easy ways to tell that. The easiest way is to look off at some vertical line uh, in the distance, uh, a mast, or look at a star. And if the images are offset, then you have an issue with that. And again, you can correct it back to zero with your adjustment. Once those are set, you typically don't have to fiddle with them at all. Unless, of course, the sextant gets dropped or damaged somehow. Now, the most important error that we deal with on a site-by-site -site basis is something called index error. And that has to do with uh, a, 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 an observation when the sextant is set at zero and you look through the mirrors, you should be seeing, I'm going to use a, a, a split view example here. You should see the real horizon through your clear glass. And over on this side, you should see a reflection of the horizon on the mirror because the sextant set at zero. So you're measuring zero degrees of altitude, which means you're measuring to the horizon. If the section is properly adjusted for index error, these will be in parallel. You won't see any difference. You can rotate the section a little bit this way or that way, which will try to separate those lines uh, to make sure. If you see the horizon up here or down here, then you have to correct for that difference. And what we do is we look through the telescope when it's set at zero, and if we see this, we adjust our micrometer drum just slightly until it brings it down to be parallel with the real horizon. And you do that two or three times just to make sure you got it right, and then you just record the difference here uh, from your micrometer drum. Now, the way we describe this error, it can be either positive or negative. Let's say this is zero. If you're, when you move your micrometer drum, you've moved in this direction, in other words, you're adding something to zero, this is positive error and it's called on the arc. Meaning you've moved onto the arc to bring these two into alignment. If on the other hand, your adjustment brings you back here, be below negative, below zero, then you're, it's called off the arc, and you would record it as a negative error. The correction is just the reverse. If your error is on the arc, your correction is negative. If your error is off the arc, your correction is positive. And we'll get to that sequence in a couple of minutes. This index error should be checked every time you take a site. So what's happening when you take a site anyways? Well, if we imagine that we're looking through our mirror, and again, I'll use a split view just to make the example more clear, and here's our horizon. There's a couple of ways to, to bring a body, what we call bringing a body down to the horizon. 
Probably the easiest way to do it is to look up at the object with the proper shades in place if necessary, of course. And with a sextant set at zero, find the body in the index mirror in your eye and then walk it down very slowly, pulling the trigger and moving the index arm along the arc until you see the body in the reflected part over here get close to the horizon. Oh, then you can shake your hands out. Usually this might take a, a few seconds to a couple of minutes, depending on how much you're bouncing around, if there's clouds, how bright the object is, and how experienced you are. Once you get the body down towards the horizon, and of course it goes without saying that you have to move perpendicular to the horizon. You can't go over to the side like this, because that's not accurate. You want to have a measurement that's straight down to the horizon. So you follow the body down, walking it down. Once you get the body close to this horizon, then you want to start manipulating your micrometer drum to bring it down even further until, if we're taking a lower limb of the sight of the sun, let's say we're going to bring the body down so that the sun just kisses the horizon. Once you get there, uh, then you want to rotate the sextant around, pivoting around the telescope so that you are, in a sense, describing an arc here with the image of the body. It may not be that dramatic, but that's what it'll look like. The reason you do that is because you want to make sure that when you record the sextant angle, that you are truly getting the body tangent to the horizon. Now, in the morning, of course, the sun continues to rise, so it's going to continue to try to get out of your field of view. And if you look at it long enough, uh, it doesn't take very long, certain times a day, it'll just disappear right out of view. So you have to keep bringing it down. Conversely, in the afternoon, when the sun is setting, lowering in the sky, it'll try to disappear down below the horizon and you have to bring it back up. So by a constant manipulation of the sextant back and forth and the micrometer drum to keep it down next to the horizon, eventually you get to a point where you're happy, you say mark, and if you have an assistant, the assistant marks the seconds and the minute and then awaits your recorded value. If you're operating this by yourself, you want to have all your stuff ready to go, have a pad of paper, a, a notebook, a whatever, uh, a whiteboard, tablet, uh, so that when you know you've got your site, you start counting 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, until you can look at your watch and record the time. You get you get better and better at this, uh, and of course at different times of day with moisture and bad weather and seas and all that, it gets, uh, sometimes it's a bit of a chore to get this all timed out right, but you just have to practice it. So once, once you have satisfied that, uh, you record the information next to the time and you record the type of body it was. Of course, before then you've already checked your index error and you're off and running. Now, I'm going to put the sextant away. I always recommend, and I always practice this, is when you're taking sights, uh, is to take uh, three. And you can do more, but three is a good number. So if you're shooting the sun, you might take three sights in quick succession. So within a minute or two, you grab three altitudes and three times. That way, if something is really out of whack, which can happen either with reading your timepiece or in taking the reading, uh, it'll become obvious because it'll be an outlier to the other two, which should trend in the same direction. Um, that's the basics of taking a site and the parts of the sextant that are important. In a later episode, I hope to get out on the water or get on the beach at least and try to take a site and get the camera to zoom in on some of the features of the recording and the, uh, the, the process. 
But as I said in the first uh, episode, you got to practice this. It doesn't come naturally. You have to learn how to do it. Okay, so that's index error, which is what we'll call error number one. That's the one we're going to be able to measure ourselves and take care of in, in our calculations. Um, the second error that we commonly, that we have to deal with for every single site, no matter what the body is, is something called height of eye. It's also called dip, and that's how it's labeled in the nautical almanac on the tables. Now, height of eye refers to just that. How high above the water is your eye? And you don't have to be compulsive about this with a tape measure and a plumb bob and all that, but it's handy to know off, you know, off the top of your head. I have a four foot free board. If I stand on the deck, I'm going to be 10 feet above the water, for example. Or if I'm standing in the cockpit, I'm only eight feet above the water. Or if I'm standing up in the cabin house, I'm 12 or 14 feet, whatever. Whatever it might be, just know certain places on the boat you're most commonly going to use for taking a sight and kind of have enough rough idea of what those uh, heights are. Generally speaking, uh, a height of eye calculation, a height of eye correction is around three minutes uh, of arc. And, you know, it doesn't seem like a lot, but four seconds of error in a calculation in time is a mile. So all of those things have a bearing on how accurate your celestial navigation is, both the recording of the time and the recording off the instrument. So why, what's, what's height of eye? Well, let's imagine that this is the surface of the Earth, and here's the horizon if we're down at the water. We're looking out right across uh, tangent to the Earth. If we stand up above the water, now our horizon is down. This is greatly exaggerated, but we're looking essentially further over the curve of the Earth. So when we take a body's measurement, we're not measuring to here, we're measuring to here. And we have to take that amount out of the calculation. So dip is always negative. It's labeled that way in the table, so you can't make a mistake. And... Uh, Getting that calculation, getting that correction is remarkably easy. One little table and you've got it. So that's the second correction. The third is something called the apparent altitude correction. Now, apparent altitude is sometimes called the main sun correction if you're dealing with the sun, but the apparent altitude correction applies to the sun, the moon, and the planets, and the stars, although it has much more uh, impact on the sun and the moon uh, because of their relative size and because they're a lot closer than all the stars. So this correction is a, a combination of three different errors. One is something called semi-diameter. And thank you to the people long ago who figured out they could put all these together in one correction. Just saves us a few steps. Semi-diameter is referring to the fact that we are taking a sight of the lower limb or the upper limb, depending on what's happening, versus a sight to the center of the sun. Remember that in the, when we're talking about theory, we're talking about a beam of light from the center of the sun to the center of the earth, and that's how all the math is set up. Well, we can't shoot to the center of the sun. We can't figure out where it is. So we use the limbs, and then the scientists have calculated the what they call the semi-diameter, which is this difference here, and that is applied in this, this correction. And... If the second part of this is something called horizontal parallax. And horizontal parallax refers similarly to the fact that we're standing on the crust of the earth and not at the center of the earth. 
and that gives us a different perspective on our sight of the sun. And this is another part of this overall correction. The third part is something called refraction. I don't think that's a mystery to us. Uh, light gets refracted by the atmosphere. And the higher a body is in the atmosphere, the less atmosphere the light has to travel through to get to us. The lower the body is in the atmosphere, the more the, it has to travel through the atmosphere to get to us. So that is a, 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 a correction that varies by the altitude of the body. All these three combine into the apparent altitude correction. Now, when you're shooting the sun, the altitude correction is either positive or negative. It's positive if you're shooting a sight of the lower limb, and it's negative if you're shooting a sight of the upper limb. In the Nautical Almanac itself, uh, all these tables, the height of eye and the apparent altitude correction, are right here on the inside front cover. Very easy to find. There's also a handy dandy card that is included in the almanac, which you can rip out and use as a bookmark and also has all those tables on them as well. But all of the correction signs are labeled in the table. So you can pull those right out with the value. Those are the three corrections, three errors we work with. Index error, we figure out beforehand. Height of eye, we figure out beforehand. Altitude correction comes once we have the site recorded. And that is what we're going to do next, is go into some examples of using these correction errors and how to correct them in a real site. But before we go, I want to say one thing about sextants. This is a great book, just a general reference book about sextants, the Sextant Handbook. It's been published for many years I think since the 80s. Uh, it's still in print, I believe. Uh, I did see it on Amazon recently. It's just a good handy reference guide for a lot of the questions that might come up with owning a sextant and using a sextant, particularly around things like cleaning them, maintaining them, replacing mirrors, and things like that. So there's other books that do the same thing. I just think it's a good idea to have a good reference book because eventually you'll probably have to replace a mirror on your sextant and it's nice to know that it's something you can do easily and to have a walk through of the steps involved. So when we take a site, we'll, uh, we'll actually uh, look at some of the mirrors and uh, talk about that as well. But for now, let's stop here. Uh, we'll reconvene with the flip chart and some actual numbers and work through some examples and then we'll be ready to go to the next phase, which is to get into the site reduction tables themselves. All right, so here's a couple of quick examples for correcting the site. We start off with the basic information. We've got the date of May 12th. We've calculated roughly that our height of eye above the water is nine feet. We've looked at our sextant through, at the horizon through our sextant and figured our index error is 2.2 minutes on the arc, which is a positive error. That means the correction will be negative. And we took our sextant site and it was 59 degrees, 18.4 minutes, lower limb of the sun. So the first thing we do is write our sextant angle down, because that's where we're going to start our calculations. Then we're going to apply our index correction. And we just reverse the sign of the index error and we make that subtraction. Next, we apply our height of eye, and we go into the dip table. And in the dip table, there are three columns of information. And the three columns of information are height of eye in meters, height of eye in feet, 
and the correction that applies in the middle. That's the main column of the dip table. On the right side are individual boxes with specific numbers. If one of those happens to match, you can pull it right out of there without going into the main table. So we enter the dip table with a high divide of nine feet and we find two numbers that bracket nine feet. Under feet, because we're measuring in feet, obviously. And that's 8.6 on the low side and 9.2 on the high side. And reading to the middle, the correction is minus 2.9. The dip's corrections are always negative and they put the sign in there for you. So make the correction, uh, the calculation here, and we come up with 59 degrees, 13.3 minutes. And that number is labeled HA for apparent. We started off with HS for sextant altitude, now we've got apparent altitude. Next. We go into the altitude correction tables themselves, which is on the far left of that page. In the box, it's labeled sun, and we have two columns, October to March and April to September. We are in the April to September box because we shot this site in May. And again, under the right column, there are three columns for us to work with. One labeled apparent altitude, one labeled lower limb, and one labeled upper limb. So we know we took a lower limb site, so we're in that lower limb box uh, column for the correction. But the first thing we do is go in under apparent altitude in the right month block, and we find two numbers that bracket 59, 13.3. Had to go pretty far down the table, and we find on the low side it's 56.59, and on the high side it's 61.50. And the correction read to the middle is plus 15.4. That's the apparent altitude correction. And again, lower limbs are always positive for the sun, upper limbs are always negative, and they give you the sign there. So we make this calculation. Uh, 59 degrees, 28.7 minutes. And that is labeled our HO for observed. That's the altitude observed that we're going to set aside until the very end of this process. So we have HS, we go to HA, and then we go in the tables and we correct for the, the apparent altitude correction and we get HO. Straightforward, let's do one more. So again, we've got all the basic data here. First thing, let's write down our HS as 38 degrees, 43.8 minutes. Let's take our index correction out. We have 1.4 minutes off the arc. That's a negative error, so it's a positive correction. Make that calculation, 38 degrees, 45.2 minutes. And then we go in under the dip table for a height of I of 12 feet. And you slide down under feet until you find values that bracket 12, and that's 11.9 on the low side and 12.6 on the high side. Read to the middle, the correction is minus 3.4. Make that correct, uh, calculation and we get a value of 38 degrees, 41.8 minutes, which is labeled H sub A for apparent altitude. And next we're going to find the apparent altitude correction. And we're going to go back over to the left side to the sun box. And we're in October, so it's in the first set of column, first column. And under apparent altitude, slide down until you find two numbers that bracket 38, 
and you find 3834 on the low side and 4106 on the high side. Reading to the right, the correction is positive 15.1. Make that calculation and you have your final observed altitude, your HO. And that's that. This is a very compact uh, calculation. You don't have to do a lot of uh, extra math with it. And when we do a full site reduction, uh, we'll find out how we can get all of this stuff, plus all the other things we have to do, uh, onto one sheet of paper. That's site correction, uh, same process, uh, step by step, that you go through with any body, uh, with just a different entering place for this part of the equation. So we're going to end up with an HO. Uh, we're going to set that aside until we get to the very end of the process, and um, that'll be it. So the next uh, thing we're going to do is to explore the uh, um, the site reduction tables themselves in the next episode. So we look forward to seeing you back at the nav station for that.